In this final section of the course, we talk about two sample hypothesis tests again, but this time our samples are paired. They are not independent. So let's check out the following example. Does drinking a small amount of alcohol reduce reaction time noticeably? 16 volunteers are given a test in which they had to push a button in response to the appearance of an image on a screen. Their reaction times were measured. Then the subjects consumed enough alcohol to raise their blood alcohol level to 0.05%. They took the reaction time test again. The reaction times in milliseconds are presented in the table below. The row labeled difference is the increase in reaction time after consuming alcohol. So a negative difference occurs when the reaction time after consuming alcohol is less. And so you see that we do actually have a few subjects with a negative difference in reaction time after consuming alcohol, meaning that those subjects were a little bit faster with alcohol in their system. But for the most part, a researcher would go into this anticipating that the majority of the people would end up with, uh, with slower times or more milliseconds in reaction time uh, when alcohol is in someone's system. Okay, so here are some things I want you to observe. When you look at this table, I want you to see that the very first sample is this middle row because the very first sample that took place was reaction time measurement without alcohol in the system. And then we have a second sample right here. And also notice that this time is very specifically paired with this time, as this time is very specifically paired with this time, because it's the same subjects before and after alcohol, okay? So at the end of the day, even though it's a two sample problem, ultimately the only thing that we really need from this table is what you see down here. You need, what we really need are the differences in reaction times. And actually I can summarize the difference in reaction times from the sample with a sample mean difference in reaction time. So I could even say X bar, and I'm gonna write this subscript D to represent it's a sample mean difference in reaction time is equal to 6.5. But if you think about what I just said, I said we're taking a two sample problem and ultimately reducing it to a single sample and then just looking at a single sample mean. And so if we're just going back to a single sample and working with a single sample mean, then you might think, yeah, we're working with a distribution of sample means. And so we don't know in this distribution of sample means where 6.5 is. We don't know if it's representative of the average difference in reaction time in the population or if it's somewhere in one of these extremes. But we do know that this is an approximately normal distribution as long as certain assumptions are met. And I will tell you that actually we have an N of 16 here. So the central limit theorem says we typically need an n of at least 30 in order to say that this sampling distribution would be approximately normal. We don't have that here. Um, and so I'm going to assume that this sample of difference of sa sample of differences in reaction times is coming from an approximately normal population of differences in reaction times. And so we kind of need that to proceed. But in order to answer our question here of does alcohol reduce reaction time, I really want to get at an analysis of this right here. And so how do we do that? Well, we do that through a hypothesis test. And so I'm going to set up some hypotheses like the following. My null hypothesis is that there is no change or no difference in reaction time in the population before and after alcohol. So I would say that the average difference in reaction time in the population would be equal to zero. And the alternate hypothesis or the researcher's hypothesis is that no, there is some positive difference in reaction time. Most people would anticipate that there is some positive difference. But remember, whenever we do a hypothesis test, we always assume the null hypothesis to be true. So if we assume in a distribution of sample means that mu sub d is equal to zero, that there is no average difference in reaction time, then 6.5 is going to be way out here. And what we do when we conduct a hypothesis test is we ultimately look for a p-value. And a p-value gives us 
the probability, assuming the null hypothesis is true, so assuming that the average difference in reaction time is zero, the probability of observing what we observe or something more extreme. And so we need to find an area. But we're doing this through a hypothesis test, so we don't have to go back to those tools that you learned back in Module 7. All we need to do is pick the correct test in the calculator. And so the only test that we used in the calculator when we were dealing with means were z-test and t-test. And so the question is, which one are we working with here? Are we using a z-test or are we going to be using a t-test? And the answer to that question is based upon, well, what kind of information are we given? Are we given a, a population standard deviation? Remember, that was one of the big things before. Were we given sigma? Uh, we're not. We only have our set of data here, our, our data of the difference in reaction times. And since we're only using our data here and we don't have sigma, we are going to use t-test. And whenever you have paired samples, a lot of times you are going to be given the data like you see here. And as a result, we're typically going to be using t-test in these types of problems. So let's go into the calculator and let's enter the data in there and we're going to use t-test and see if we can arrive at the p-value uh, to draw a conclusion about whether or not to reject this null and accept that alcohol does on average slow reaction time. Okay so I go into stat edit and I have to first get my data in there right so you can see that I've entered in L1 the reaction times with alcohol in the system and then in L2 I entered the reaction times without alcohol in the system but the data that I actually want are these differences so I'm gonna to go to L3 and you're gonna be doing this in the homework and I'm going to say let's do L1 minus L2 and then you're going to see when I do this and press enter that the values that I get are exactly the same as the values that, that are in this differences row so I, I went to the very top of L3 highlighted it did L1 minus L2 so when I go to t-test in the calculator, I have to reference L3 now. So let's do that. So we'll go stat, test, t-test. I've selected data. The null value of my mean is zero. Let's double check that's what we have over here. Yep, the null value of the mean is zero. The list where I've entered everything, you can see I've already entered L3 in here because that's where my differences lie. Frequency is going to be left at 1 always, and you can see that our alternate hypothesis is that the average difference in reaction time is greater than 0. That would be this selection. So we can just go down, press calculate, and we will get our p-value. And we get a p-value of 0 0.0097. So that says if there really is no difference in reaction time on average in the population, then for us to get a difference in reaction time in our sample of 6.5, or an average difference in reaction time of 6.5, that's pretty unlikely. So instead of saying some really unlikely thing is occurring, we are going to reject the null, and we can accept that alcohol slows reaction time And that would be on average. Now you'll notice that I rejected the null without even comparing to a significance threshold. Um, and I did not provide a significance threshold in this problem. Uh, but you can see that this p-value is even smaller than the lowest significance thresholds we've seen. So if I went back here to be completely accurate and said, okay, let's even use the lowest significance threshold we've seen in this class of 0.01, you can see that the p-value would have been less than that significance threshold. So that's the idea. A two-sample problem when you have paired samples gets reduced to a single sample of differences and ultimately you end up working with a t-distribution and so we end up doing a t-test in these types of problems. Let's do one more like this. So in this example it says a sample of five third graders took a reading test. They then participated in a reading improvement program and took the test again to determine whether their reading ability had improved. 
Following are the test scores for each of the students both before and after the program. Can you conclude that the mean reading score increased after the program? So this is actually our this is actually our first sample right here. This is before the program. This is our second sample. And we are anticipating that the differences are going to be positive. Now we could figure out these differences on our own here. Um, but I think it's also good practice to let the calculator do it. So let's go into the calculator and enter our data. And we can clear out our previous L1 and L2. And L1 is now 67, 68, 78, 75, and 84. L2, 59, 63, 81, 74, and 78. And it's very important that you put those numbers exactly where you see them because the 59 goes with the 67, the 63 goes with the 68, etc. I'm going to clear out list three and then once again do list three is L1 minus L2 to get those differences in uh, in reading scores. And so here it says, let mu sub d denote the population mean difference after minus before. So again, that's why I just did L1 minus L2. That's Those are the differences after minus before. State the appropriate null and alternate hypotheses about mu sub d. And so the null would be that there is no average difference in, re, in not reaction time, in uh, test scores. There's no average difference in the test scores before and after the program. But the alternate is that there is going to be some positive average difference in reaction time. We, we are anticipating these differences to be positive when you say after the reading program minus before the reading program. Okay, so we are going to perform a t-test as I said because we saw previously that our two sample problem is getting reduced to a single sample of differences. So we're going to say stat test. t-test is number two. Once again the null value of the mean is zero. Once again, the list that we want to reference is L3. And once again, in this case, our alternate hypothesis is also going to be greater than the null value of the mean. And so we can go down here and press calculate. And in this case, we get a p-value of 0.0793. Do you reject the null at alpha equals 0.05? No, you would fail to reject the null because the p-value is greater than alpha here. And in order to reject the null, we need the p-value to be less than alpha. And the last part just says state a conclusion. And the conclusion here would be it is inconclusive whether or not the, the average score is is or the average difference in score is going to be positive after this reading program. So, um, so I'm going to say it is inconclusive, and you could even summarize this by saying it is inconclusive whether or not the reading program was effective. We just don't have strong enough data, and a big part of that reason is because we have a really small sample size here. So, hopefully, this helps explain this general idea of working with paired samples in hypothesis tests.